Uh, the National Gallery and Roy Lichtenstein, um, he is a very special artist to us um, for a number of reasons. Uh, we have four great paintings in the collection, three of which are on view, and they are uh, Look Mickey, uh, which Roy considered his first pop painting, and which Roy and Dorothy donated to the National Gallery on the occasion of our 50th anniversary and as well, uh, two paintings given by uh, Robert and Jane Meyerhoff in their collection, the Entablature from 1974, which is actually in the West Building, um, installed over a Canova sculpture, and the painting with Statue of Liberty from 1983 in the East Building. Uh, speaking of the Meyerhoff's pictures of fape, they were great uh, collectors, of course, of Roy's work and have promised uh, some 10 paintings to the National Gallery, including the great uh, bedroom at Arles, the, uh, the billboard version, uh, updated version of Van Gogh's painting, and as well as drawings and sculptures. Um, and, and then we were very rich in drawings, um, and especially drawings connected to those Meyerhoff works, uh, again, thanks to Dorothy, who, who chose and donated um, all the studies for the works in the Meyerhoff collection. Um, sculptures, you know, it goes on and on. We have, we have about 10 sculptures, most notably House One in the Sculpture Garden, um, which I'm sure you all know, which um, plays with that uh, wonderful optical illusion, sometimes called the Chinese dragon. So uh, you have to walk by it to get it. You don't just walk towards it. Um, and some 300 prints. Uh, we have presented two major exhibitions in 1994. We did the retrospective of Roy Lichtenstein's prints in conjunction with a catalog raisonné that we published then, written by our own Mary Lee Corlett. Uh, and with an introduction by our own, uh, formerly our own Ruth Fine. And then uh, recently in 2013, we were the only East Coast venue for the Lichtenstein retrospective, which was co-organized by uh, Tate and Art Institute of Chicago and was also seen at the Pompidou. So uh, we still have some gaps to fill, but we're doing pretty well with uh, the work of, of uh, this great, great artist, um, you know, one of the co-founders, I think we can say, of, of American pop art, along with Andy Warhol. And um, that term, pop art, uh, I think does justice to neither of them, but probably especially poor justice to Roy's uh, work, which um, went in so many different uh, directions, um, from, from Look Mickey uh, on, and the rest is, is history. Um, you have a brochure which gives extensive biographies of, of these uh, distinguished guests, and I'm about to turn it all over to them. Um, but I'll just briefly uh, introduce Rob Store on my left, professor of painting, former dean of the Yale School of Art. And uh, so in addition to being teacher, administrator, we have artist, critic, curator, and probably several other uh, terms on your byline. Um, he had a distinguished career at the Museum of Modern Art for some dozen years, uh, directed visual arts at the Venice Biennale for two years, and so on. Um, and uh, I'll move over to Jack, Jack Cowart, uh, way over there, who is the founding executive director of the Roy Lichtenstein Foundation, which was set up in 1999. And he had his own distinguished curatorial career before that, including positions at the Wadsworth Athenaeum, the St. Louis Art Museum, and the Corcoran. And then there were a few years here, uh, seven years at the National Gallery. And um, you were my predecessor, or I am your successor, uh, something we, like we that. We wanted to make it easy for you. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Sure, easier. Yeah. And uh, finally, Dorothy Lichtenstein, it's a pleasure to welcome you back here after, after a few years to this, uh, um, this stage. Um, she is the president of the Roy Lichtenstein Foundation, which she set up after her husband's death in 1997. 
And in addition to what must be a full-time job there, she is very active on a great many uh, boards and foundations uh, in the arts and in the sciences as well. So she's also a great person just to uh, go around the galleries and look at art with uh, of all kinds. Um, and our order of ceremonies will be um, a couple of, of very interesting slideshows. Uh, Rob is going to give us a little history of, of murals, really, in the 20th century. Um, Jack is going to follow uh, with a close look at the development of the Green Street mural. And um, then we'll have some conversation and um, recollections. So uh, you're on. OK, uh, this is going to have to be lickety split because um, there's a lot of ground to cover. Um, but first of all, to be said is that really Dorothy's generosity and the foundation's generosity in this case is truly exceptional. And as the uh, cult, sort of the commissioner advisor of the uh, commissions for FAPE, I hesitated before going to her with a suggestion, uh, which she readily accepted and uh, then checked with the foundation and the foundation is a whole proof. So I'll give you a reason for doing that, but I just want to say how much we are in her debt because already she had given works of art to FAPE, already she'd been a collaborating member of our sort of expanded family, so uh, she is the belle of the ball truly today. <laughs> um, <Thank you. laughs> Now, the thing that occurred to me when I started looking at the plans that Todd Williams and Billy Chen had made for this uh, new building, yet to be built building in Mexico City was how many walls it has. Uh, and uh, through a series of circumstances, which I won't get into, um, I came to know the mural movement in Mexico very well from the inside. I worked briefly for one of the mural painters, to whom incidentally I was introduced by Elizabeth Catlett, who was then in exile in Mexico. Um, due to McCarthyism. Anyway, um, the point of it is that the United States and uh, Mexico have one thing in common, walls. <laughs> <laughs> and they have them in common aesthetically, whatever else they may mean politically. Um, there have been active mural traditions uh, in Mexico really since the Aztecs, and in this country uh, really since the 30s. And for the um, artists of the abstract expressionist, expressionist generation and before, um, the, the example of what the Mexican muralists did was very, very important. All the principal Mexican muralists were in this country for various uh, periods of time. All of them taught or hired artists from this country to work on their crews. And they set an example that really, really inspired American artists, challenged American artists in ways that you won't necessarily know about in art history books. Because generally, the Mexican chapter is circumscribed by a very political understanding of what muralism could be and by a particular political period, which was the 30s. Um, it goes before that and it comes after that. So I'm going to show you some very quick slides, but just to say that in thinking about what to ask for for this project, I thought murals because it seemed to me that the best way to build dialogue back and forth across these two cultures, uh, actually multiple cultures in both cases, was to have something that we had in common and what we have in common in that way is murals. So um, I went to Dorothy sort of uh, hesitatingly because it's, I said she'd already been generous, but I thought if there was something that Roy had not done permanently that was still sitting and available, we could not want anything more than that under these circumstances. And so this is why this is such a big deal. Because this is kind of an extended dialogue over a long period of history in a medium and in a format which both sides understand and both sides have long histories in. So it's a, it's a grounds for conversation. Anyway, very quickly. Um, in, at, shortly after the Mexican Revolution, Jose Vasconcelos, who was in charge of education and other things, uh, had the idea that public buildings should be decorated by artists to public effect, that that should be a way to reach the large uh, masses of Mexicans, many of whom were illiterate, to think about their own history. Uh, and the first commissions that were done were in the Preparatoria Nacional in Mexico City, and then it grew from there. Now, I just went with my daughter uh, Susie uh, to Mexico, and we went around and did all those places. And so some of these slides were done with her. Um, but in any case, uh, she's a painter, by the way. Um, anyway, so, uh, so these, these, these uh, images are images of what happened starting in the teens and the 20s in Mexico, and then went on and on and on. So I'm going to do it very fast. It does not do justice to the works, but it'll give you an idea of what this huge tranche of art history in the Americas, plural, is, 
and how this particular mural will fit into a natural uh, set of circumstances that then can grow. So here, this is an Aztec fresco from the uh, Museo Antropología in Mexico City, and this is as old as God, practically. This is one of Diego Vera's main murals. This is in the Palacio Nacional. This is, I'm afraid, one of my not very good slides. But it shows one important thing. It shows how, in muralism generally, one of the principal challenges was how paintings fit with architecture. <coughs> how they are accented by architecture or how they respond to architecture. So this is a complex program of images about Mexican history, but it is also in the building, truly. And this is the other staircase on the opposite side. This is the famous Rockefeller mural that was then destroyed at Rockefeller Center and then recreated in the Palacio de Bellas Artes in Mexico City. And it shows that murals are not necessarily circumstantial, not necessarily site-specific. They can be recreated under certain circumstances. And this is the mural that was and now is. This they, is a mural. They recreate the whole? They recreated the whole thing. Yeah. Yeah. He, came, he came to the Palacio de Bellas Artes and started from scratch and painted the whole thing. And we see. Lenin there, who, we was, do. who was the big problem, mm -hmm. uh, uh, yes. Uh, who, just to give you an idea of the vicissitudes and vagaries of politics, is now somebody uh, heavily quoted by uh, Steve Bannon, I believe. Um, <laughs> now, um, here is Chapingo, which is a chapel, a former church, turned into a kind of uh, a, a chapel for the celebration of fecundity, of agricultural fecundity. This is the dream of an afternoon in the Parque Alameda. This is a great, again, a mural of his, long, horizontal, and in it you see all the characters of Mexican art, including Jose Guadalupe Posada, uh, Frida Kahlo, etc., etc., etc. Now this is a different kind of muralism, but it is all of a piece. This is in Detroit. And this was almost lost when the idea was that they would close the D Detroit Museum over financial uh, considerations. But fortunately that did not happen, and it is there still. And this is just one panel. This is, in of all places, the San Francisco Stock Exchange. So Diego Rivera, who was in fact a communist, uh, a rather ardent one, nonetheless uh, had good relations with many business people and did in fact do things that were culturally uh, for the benefit of absolutely everybody, even stockbrokers. <laughs> this is Jose Clemente Orozco, who was of a huge impact on Jackson Pollock. Pollock watched him paint a mural in the lobby of the Museum of Modern Art and never forgot it. And if you look at late Pollock, you will see all kinds of hints of Orozco coming back into his work after his all over paintings. This is a painting which was an attempt to resolve racial divides in Mexico. It is Cortez with his wife, Malinche, or his concubine, whatever you want. And it was an attempt, he was the only Mexican who had uh, Indian blood of all the Mexican muralists. And he did not see it as this and that, them and us, but rather us and us. This is one of my bad photographs, but this is called, on the one hand, the uh, collapse of civilization, and on this side, the trench. And this is a mural also in Bellas Artes, not far from the one I showed you, Rivera, and their extreme. This is in Pomona College. Uh, it's still, and if you look up in the dining hall, this looks down on you. It's Prometheus. And this is Siqueiros. No, no, this is all Orozco. That's Orozco. That's the Siqueiros. It's, mis it's mislabeled, sorry. Uh, it's a okay, I, I promise I asked, you. I, yes. <laughs> I've seen it, I know. <laughs> and this, of all places, in, is in the library of Dartmouth College. Again, so when you think about the uh, political dynamics of this, these are in places you would not expect to find them. And this, particularly in Dartmouth College, is about stillborn knowledge. Mm. Tough paintings. This is in the New School for Social Research in downtown Manhattan. It is still there. This is also a Roscoe. And this is also Orozco. Um, there are several other murals there, but this is, these are the two great ones. This is a painting by Siqueiros. This is Siqueiros. This is a painting which was painted under the eyes of both Philip Guston and Jackson Pollock. And both of them were terribly impressed by this. It's since been lost, although there are attempts to recover it because it's on the side of a building. But this is a, a mural which in its time was seminal to American painters of this America. And here's another one, also uh, in Los Angeles, which was seminal to American painters of North America. This is a painting uh, that's in the Sindicato de Electricistas in Mexico City. The whole space of the painting is a little wider than us on this stage. 
And what Siqueiros decided to do was to use photography and collage to explode it in the manner of Baroque painters and also in the manner of Sergei Eisenstein, who was his friend from whom he learned a lot of this, and also in the manner of John Hartfield, who was somebody else he knew who was involved in this. So this is one of the most uh, synthetic paintings of all of the mural paintings and the most radical that uh, uh, Sikos ever did. And you can see the railing there. That is the width of the staircase. So this is a kind of exploded photograph. These are some of the details. This is the use of spray paint and stencils to make murals. This was very much uh, not done before this. And he was a great innovator. Whatever you may think of his art, he was one of the great innovators in this field. This is another version of the part of the same painting. But what you don't know is that this man is turning a corner. So his illusionistic presentation defies the actual spatial boundaries. And this, I thought is appropriate, um, this is the uh, demagogue uh, who is on a, uh, how is kind of a screw going up and down and ranting. This is Siqueiros in Bellas Artes also. And this is Siqueiros in the Palazzo Chipultepec, which is, he again goes around corners. And this is at the National University UNAM. And this is mural. mural, mural. This is a, actually a painting that I worked on. This is the one that I was his assistant for. Which and this part? Is, uh, uh, Polyforum. Which part did you do? Uh, all over the place. I was, I, Susie and I were there together, and I, I, she sort of asked the same question. Oh, there's a little red up there and a little green down there. <laughs> yeah. I was a cog in the machine, believe me. Um, anyway, and this is another part of it. Now, to tell you that it is not all the Mexicans, muralism was a very popular concept in many places, particularly among, among artists who wish to do something for mass audiences. So this is uh, Fernand Leger in Bio, uh, and this is one of many such things that he did in the latter half of his career. And this is in Argentin, I think it's in France. This is another ceramic mural of Leger. And this is Stuart Davis. This is for the uh, men's lounge at Radio City Music Hall. It's currently in the collection of MoMA, but it was in the collection of uh, Radio City Music Hall. Uh, if you ever went to see, as I did, people uh, like Ella Fitzgerald, you could you know, actually go down the men's room and enjoy that. This is the sketch for another mural. So muralism was a very big deal in this country from the 30s onward. And actually, if you take Thomas Hart Benton, who comes next, sorry, this is Philip Gustin. This is Philip Gustin working at a mural in Morelia, in Mexico, for Siqueiros. This is Philip Gustin in a post office, if I'm not sure, in the Department of Health and Human Services in Washington. This is Thomas Hart Benton, and this is also very early. So the, the aesthetic divisions here are not according to party politics, not according to any other thing, and they're actually not according, you know, Benton was the so-called reactionary regional painter, but he was having a lot of fun. And what did he do? There was a certain style of uh, vignetting photographs in newspapers that he then turned into molding. So this is also based on graphic art rather than on uh, uh, just, you know, old uh, traditions of muralism. And this is in the New School of Social Research. This used to be uptown at uh, a building on 6th Avenue. This is Jackson Pollock's mural for Peggy Guggenheim. Uh, Pollock never painted a full-scale mural himself, but he was involved in doing things in Siqueiros' studio, and he learned almost all of his techniques of dripping and adding materials from Siqueiros, not from uh, uh, Max Terrence, as is often said, not from anybody else. Now this is Al Held in the subways. Al Held uh, was a painter who was very much interested in what Siqueiros did, wanted to go work for him, never did, uh, and always had the kind of the, the, the yearning, the hankering to make a big, big picture. So when he made his big pictures, they were sometimes on canvas and sometimes on mosaic. So these are public paintings for people in subways. You can see him going around corners too, exploding uh, architecture. And this, of course, is Saul Lewitt. And Solowit, this is, on the, this is a ceiling you know, that Solowit did. And then this is also Solowit. Now, I'm going to leave it here, but this just gives you a very simple idea of what has been done and of the continuity of this kind of painting. You will see at the State Department that there is, in fact, a mural from a previous uh, generation, uh, a, a representational mural, so that there is a maquette of the mural that Lichtenstein is, uh, did and will, we will realize above the door, and as you go through, there's another one. So when people talk about the public politics of finance and the art and so on and so forth, we have been doing this in this country since the 1930s, and there's no reason we can't do it now. Uh, thanks, Rob, for completely um, 
stunning the crowd. <laughs> and uh, I'm left, I'll have about six minutes of, not to do a, a, a lecture on Roy Lichtenstein, which is usually my default clause, uh, but it's, it's a delight to be back at the National Gallery, and thank you, Harry. Yeah. And um, indeed, we have uh, been thinking about this, if not this program, for a long time. Uh, and the, the question of whether Roy Lichtenstein would call himself a muralist or whether, at one time, he would call himself, oh, I think it was a painting on a wall. Uh, because if any person was not presumptuous and, and egomaniacal, that would be Roy Lichtenstein. Uh, for the sake of today's little run, I, I wanted to say at least kind of where it started, in my view. Uh, and indeed, Roy did know the murals of, uh, of Stuart Davis. He certainly knew about things like Guernica, and he was very involved in the whole history of art. So this was an informed artist um, who didn't labor us with all the things that he knew. Relatively, he took it for granted, and we just moved on, and he did his thing. But this is... Uh, just the size of laid up against the front of a garage, his garage in New Jersey, when he was asked by uh, Philip Johnson, who was the architect and the kind of the maitre d of the surface decoration for the New York State uh, Pavilion for the New York World's Fair in 1964. And uh, Johnson went to Andy Warhol, he went to uh, Bob Indiana and Red Roy and about five or six other artists, Charles Hinman, shape canvases, to uh, articulate this relatively bland uh, concrete building. It kind of made the, the Hirshhorn look good. Um, I can do that as, uh, as, a, as a neighbor of, um, of Washington for 35 years. The, uh, but this idea of this was a hand-painted um, painting of a, a smaller scale uh, pop girl, girl window. And it was, um, Roy was capable of making big paintings. So the, the question of where it stopped being a big painting and a mural is, is an interesting one. It is also uh, the deal, it's a single image, more or less. And it is because of that, that uh, the, uh, the Green Street mural is different. And we'll get to this in a minute. Uh, and on the other hand, there is Roy with his two sons, Mitchell and David, and bringing them to see the World's Fair. I went to see the World's Fair. I think I did not see this, and I don't know why, but I, was, I, was, I figured I was out of high school. I should have been paying better attention, but I didn't know that I would be doing this gig in 2017. Mm -hmm. This is Roy's uh, first uh, articulate mural and it is actually painted on the walls. And though he'll say in the film that you'll see at the end, he said it's the first that the Green Street mural is the one he really painted himself. This was painted by an assistant uh, who was uh, designated to go out and to work on this project. It is in uh, the University of Dusseldorf uh, in the medical school uh, lobbies for the, um, the lecture halls. And uh, we got it to be particularly spruced up uh, for this photo shoot. Uh, otherwise, it has uh, things plastered on it and meeting and, <laughs> and class notices and uh, other kinds of posters. But uh, we have been working with them to, uh, to talk about the, uh, the preservation of this object. And they're very uh, agreeable to this. Uh, they would be more agreeable if we contributed to the, the paying for it. <laughs> Uh, but we are, try we are trying to be enthusiastic, and so that is to, to help the, the chancellor uh, to deal with this. But this was designed specifically for the space. Now, it, it, historically, it was designed wrongly because the measurements were wrong. This is kind of like Matisse, who was making uh, the dance for the Barnes Foundation, where they mismeasured the, the alcoves or the, the, uh, the lunettes over the doors. So his uh, assistant was sent out with the mission of expand it to fit. You know how to do it. <laughs> and so she worked with the sign painters to, in fact, uh, make it stretch into the, the final form. So I think he learned from that experience that he should always do his measuring himself. <coughs> uh, this is Roy in 1983, and the, uh, he came uh, Leo Castelli was opening a second gallery. Roy had an exhibition in the first gallery on West Broadway, 
And this Green Street uh, Gallery was opening up. It had this tremendously long wall that ran uh, from the front of the gallery to the back. And this isn't exactly Roy the deer in the headlights, but I think he's thinking, what am I in for and how big does this really have to be? And here I am, and this is what I'm working with. This is a photographic montage of his maquette that he would use. It has a scale line drawn through the center, but this is the beginning of the day work, and I think they had maybe four or five or six weeks to, um, to pull it off so it could open at the same time as the exhibition. Um, the deal was that they would project from the maquettes onto the wall, and Roy always redrew everything himself anyway. He, he didn't want it to be too good a projection, in fact, because he was at that time adjusting it for the specificity of the, of the work. Um, there is a part in this, I'm promising a film after, after because I know it's coming and you <clears> don't, <throat> but there is, you'll see him dragging this. This is the brushstroke of this composition that's on your panel as you, you have it in your program, um, but is the how to make a brushstroke. And this is a, a, a direct, without a brush, uh, which is also a direct relationship to work he was making in the 1958, 1959, 1960, where he was doing brushstrokes by any means but a brush. And it is an abstract expressionist before he became a pop artist of types. Uh, Roy was egalitarian, he was diplomatic, he was democratic, in a small d, big d, uh, and he invited others to come and work on the project. This is Leo Castelli, to whom, after re realizing probably Leo couldn't do too much wrong because it was already taped in, uh, but there he is, <laughs> or that others uh, had already done this, but he invited others to come by and to participate uh, for amusement's sake, and, the, and again, it's an indication of Roy that he wasn't precious about the, uh, the artistic character. He was much more interested in the composition, the conception, the fact that he invented uh, this thing, but it already had numbers of workers who were uh, working under his direction and with him. Uh, this is pri his primary painting uh, assistant at that time, the studio assistant, James De, De Pasquale, uh, on one side, and I think the other is you. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, so Dorothy, Dorothy was brought into, <laughs> Shanghai into, into activity too. Uh, here's some other members of the team. Uh, Olivia Mach is down kneeling, uh, removing tape. And uh, Brian O'Leary uh, is in the, in the, in the red um, coverall. Roy up on this uh, threatening. This, uh, 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 Mural is 18 feet high and about 93, 95 feet long. And it was done by the projection, by uh, taping, by this uh, product of uh, kind of a, a make-do uh, assessment of getting it all done. And the artist's formal portrait thereafter, of course, uh, all cleaned up and, and ready for action. The and this is what it would, if you could squeeze yourself up against the back wall of this gallery, you would, uh, that's the best view you could get of it. It's, it's effectively, it was impossible to see. I saw it back in 1983 when this opened. And it's always a, a sliding glance that you would get on the, on the left-hand side of you as you came in. But if you'd back up and then read through the columns, um, this is the final, uh, the final motif. I don't know for my, don't, okay, so we'll back up. Um, this is in this process of uh, Roy Lichtenstein giving, uh, in my view, I've always seen these big paintings, and the one that, um, the, the painting with Liberty up on the top uh, um, bridge, is uh, Lichtenstein excerpting from himself, kind of recombining his, uh, his motifs, and there are kind of, there's, uh, the film will run through the kind of the art history from 1969 on the one hand to Picasso on the, on the far right hand edge. But uh, it was Roy having this flexibility and the security to not only things, do things like na monuments of pyramids, uh, but also goofy things like Swiss cheese and uh, the big drag or the, or the office interiors. Uh, the, his attempt and desire to recombine uh, his own imagery, which he knew very well, in a 
uh, synopsis of and how complicated he could make it. And he largely came to this through surrealism, right before this period of, of work in 1978 and 79. In 80, he was doing a number of uh, European subject matter from German Expressionism, but also to Surrealism. And it was a Surrealist kind of dream r relief of being able to uh, combine, recombine materials and, and, and subjects. Now, as I said, Roy would regard this as a wall painting. It was attached to the wall. It was, the wall was then destroyed at the end of the exhibition. We did then recreate the wall uh, that wall in, a, in the Gagosian Gallery a couple of years ago, and we brought it back using commercial sign painters, and so we look forward to seeing what could be done in Mexico City for the uh, mural that will be there for much longer than a, a two-month exhibition. But this is, the, this is the short story of Roy up to the Green Street mural before he made four or five other murals and other mural designs that he did affect or did not because either the commissions went away or that Roy died in 1997. So thank you very much. I'll leave that up, would you? I, I don't have any slides. Mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> or family pictures. <laughs> thank you, Jack and Rob. And Dorothy doesn't have any slides, but I think she has some, some slides in her head and some uh, recollections of um, what this was like. I, I would love to hear. Um, just what comes to your mind? Uh, well, we had been living in, uh, we had moved uh, to Southampton, Long Island, and we had been living there fully and let our loft in the city go. And we didn't, we moved back in 1982. And I think that somehow Roy coming back to the city, he was really uh, excited about that. And Leo Costelli had this new space and um, there was also a lot of conceptual art uh, around. And I think he kind of liked the idea of a piece that would be impermanent. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, it was sort of with the idea of conceptual mm -hmm. art. Mm -hmm. And um, when he saw that wall, he uh, really got this idea to do the, uh, the mural and to relate it architecturally. Um, he loved systems, you know. I mean, he kind of invented easel systems and wall easels, and uh, uh, I think he liked to do that. And he was really he was good at it. So I the mean, challenge, the practical yeah, challenge. Yeah, that's right. Was uh, but he he really did it with slides and projections, which is how he worked in his studio on his own uh, on his own paintings. Uh, he would project at night and uh, loosely draw them and then uh, work on them afterwards to, uh, you know, make the formal composition um, good. And it is a kind of um, history of his own art. And uh, he had done uh, some appropriation. I mean, he had already uh, done early, earlier work in the, in the 60s where he used Picasso's, etc., and I know uh, the Swiss cheese looked like surrealism to him. I mean, that was one of the things. <laughs> That's that, a good definition of surrealism, <laughs> I think. That it had these kind of yeah. miscellaneous-shaped yes. holes, amoeba-like holes, etc. So he's appropriating himself, appropriating others in in uh, many cases. That's right, and, and I mean uh, also, yeah. I mean using things like an electrical wire and office furniture, I mean, as he said, he often painted things that he himself thought he would never want to live with. Mm -hmm. Yes, <laughs> right, right, right. <laughs> well, to me, it looks like he's having his cake and eating it too. I have several <laughs> other cakes because there's a pyramid, which is ancient, there's the Brancusi sculpture, which is modern. Yeah. There's the composition book, which could be a reference to Warhol. Or Pollock. There's, 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 or Pollock. Or there's the figure, which is next to that, which is a cubist figure. And then there's a biomorphic figure, who is the woman next to that. It really is an amazing amalgamation and kind of um, stirring up of all these different tendencies. But it looks only like him. Well, I think that's true. I mean, I think there was a signature look that Roy had. Um, but he... Um, before he dabbled in abstract expressionist 
He had a long career really as an artist when he was teaching and living in Ohio. Uh, and he, uh, he did things that were really more out of Cubism then, but uh, the subject matter that he used in that was to come back in an ironic way mm -hmm. uh, when he started pop art. I mean, he would do um, kind of mock these great paintings of great American history. Well, he was very much involved in the, in, in the falsification of history when you see paintings that capture Washington crossing the Delaware. That really didn't happen that way. But it was Emanuel Leutz's idea that this is what it would look for an iconic work. So this uh, idea of this uh, subject matter was very, in, Roy was involved in the absurdities of some historical and other uh, kind of classical subject matter in the 1950s. Uh, and then he, for the, for the work like this, which would say, well, what does it mean and what is its story? It has, I mean, Roy has a, there is, you can construct a kind of a narrative. It's not a linear narrative, but it's an associative narrative. But uh, I always like there's a spiky figure on the um, left-hand side of the uh, curvilinear female form. And that the, the spiky person, the surrealist ones, is the guy. And then the smooth is the woman. And, but if you would ask Roy what he was really about, he would say, I am an abstract painter. And that I like, uh, I'm, I'm painting shapes and that it's the shapes and it's the challenge of the composition that is, is what's going to, the overall composition, which is going to tell the, make it right. He would say that, but not in that way. <laughs> um, <laughs> well, that's why we why yeah. get these panels together. <laughs> uh, no, I think um, that uh, he thought subject matter was really important, but once it was decided, he did work on it and uh, painted as, as, as if it were a, an abstract mm -hmm. painting, really looking just for the form. Uh, I think he was, uh, he invented an easel uh, that rotated completely, and he usually painted with a mirror behind him so that he, he was always trying to get distance um, on the painting. And as, as Jack, I'm sort of uh, I'm amazed to be here, as Jack said, Roy was, uh, well, he was kind of reticent, uh, not in his work. I mean, that painting was really his life wherever he'd go. I mean, he got the idea for the Greek temple uh, from a coffee cup. You know, those Greek coffee shops have the Greek temple motif on them. <laughs> and so he was really always, um, thinking about that, but he was rather shy and he never really liked to have to uh, speak in public if he was getting any kind of an award. He was really brief, so if there is any kind of an afterlife, he's probably laughing his head off at me <laughs> no. now. I'm sure he's being forgiving, here. forgiving you. <laughs> I keep looking at the extension cord and if that's what it is, and if, if I'm not wrong, it's it's one of the elements that is novel here, or was there a painting uh, ever of an extension? It, no, cord? this is uh, novel, and he worked. I mean, he would probably think, "Oh yes, well, we need uh, some, you know, orange here in this kind right. of a form, some curve, something." Uh, but he did have a lot of extension mm -hmm. cords lying around the studio, yeah. <laughs> hooked up to fans. It's a strong element, and it's also one of the few that crosses one of those vertical uh, divisions. I think so. It really. Uh, Maybe it's tying everything together, uh, I don't know. Well, the original uh, design for this actually was set up in much more in panels. I mean, mm -hmm. this is in the- Separate in panels. The, you you yeah. can see this all on our website. Mm -hmm. uh, <laughs> but then it became much more interactive and it did, uh, it did transgress and it did morph across and did carry across both by color and design. And there is this bivalence, I think also, and always in Roy's work between the subject matter or the image of the subject matter and then the effect of it had, if you squint and, and stop to de not decoding or identifying all the points. I mean, now the Brancusi uh, newborn looks much, to me much more like a mouse from a computer. Uh, and nobody knows what uh, Eddy machine tape looks like anymore, the same way they don't, the Oldenburg uh, typewriter eraser in the, in the National Sculpture Garden. what that is. Anyway. Or the punch card on the lower uh, right, the silver uh, kind of, um, 
mechanistic, at, or the, as he will say, the Guernica lamp. So there are things that are embedded in here that are very much surface, uh, they're subject matter driven. And um, also you'll find that he would also have a tendency to say, or I say on his behalf again, is that uh, what you see is not always what you get. That there is a dialogue and these are open and it is associative and you can play into this without being shut out by this is a defined statement. Well, that leads into my other question, I guess, which is uh, about this translation that's going to happen uh, to Mexico City, to um, an outdoor uh, setting, and uh, Rob's idea, which must have occasioned a lot of thinking and discussion, and um, you can get into it as, as much or as little as you like, but I'm, I'm very curious about what just some of the issues that that raised. Well, we thought of that actually when um, they, Gagosian wanted to reproduce, I mean, the wall and have paintings that Roy did that related to it as part of the exhibition. And we did really question um, how should we do this again? And of course, it should be done in, material, in something that would not continue to exist. I mean, that. Uh, yeah. panels that were done at Gagosian. And this was in 2000 and uh, what? Uh, 13? A few years ago. Yeah, something. Yeah. Seven. yeah. Uh, so those were destroyed. Mm -hmm. uh, and I mean, we didn't want it to become an object to that mm -hmm. could be sold. I, I, I think uh, Roy's idea, uh, there was something you really liked, the idea about the fact that it would be, you know, destroyed. and. The, in fact, it was really hard to paint over it to get the wall white at Green Street, and they actually had to build another wall over it eventually. So mm -hmm. you know that was nailed in. It didn't want to be destroyed. Didn't want to be destroyed. So, um, but when uh, we were approached, really uh, by by Faith, which is such a great organization and has really uh, done. Uh, an amazing amount for you know American artists by having their work throughout the world in different embassies um, in Mexico. I mean, it seemed uh, it seemed just something that would be good to do and that we would love to have done. And you know how to recreate something. Well, of course, today with I mean there are all sorts of methods where you can exactly get some something done and um, reproduce it. Uh, but I know we were talking, I mean, Roy did do a sculpture in Barcelona that uh, is composed of tile, which is not so usual for him, but because of all the Gaudis there, mm -hmm. uh, he wanted to refer to that. And he did work in the 60s that were uh, porcelain, enamel, on steel, it's a really strong material. It's what most of the subway it's a, uh, signs were made of uh, in the early days. And he had a company that worked with him. And when, when he did other murals that were on canvas panels, I mean, he had a way of breaking the panels up. So it's possible that this could be done in a number of panels mm -hmm. that, that would be mm -hmm. assembled to form the whole. Mm -hmm. yeah. Well, actually, we were going to leave this all to faith. Yes. To figure out how, how to do it. Trust in faith. Um, no, the, no um, I mean, I think it's, it is a negotiation because what we, we want, what we can do is to promise you that it will be the best way it can be done. And we can raise the resources so that it'll look great. And so mm -hmm. we just want to find out what great would mean and what the, the conservation issues are and so on and so forth. Um, I have thoughts about it, but I don't have any premeditated version of how it should be. So let's just proceed with that conversation. I just want to say one thing, though, about this, which I think is really interesting in light of all the precedents, which is that this is an, not an exercise, it's a demonstration of what Hans Hoffman talked about in push -pull, how colors advance and retreat, how shapes advance mm -hmm. and retreat, and how you take a flat thing and make it look like it's a relief, you know? And yeah. the, the, dynam the visual dynamics of this are incredibly powerful. And they keep breaking in and jumping out and doing all of that. And that means that, you know, whereas other artists have challenged to sort of create the illusion that the wall isn't there, 
This takes the wall as foil and really, really sort of levers off of it and then sinks back into it. And I think that's fantastic. Mm. Yes, thank you, <laughs> Zane. <laughs> and I suppose, my thought anyway, that you know, in Mexico City, whatever form it takes, it will be in some ways a different uh, work of art, um, mm -hmm. much more different than the Gagosian recreation um, was to the original. And maybe there's a um, uh, some sort of uh, uh, grace there that um, allows it to continue and not attempting in, in any way to be um, facsimile. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. And, and, and it's going to be in a courtyard, which is this sort of the, the, the point of entrance for everybody. Diplomats, people getting visas, all of this. So this will be seen by an enormous number of people and will be kind of a way of saying, welcome, join the... Visas? <laughs> There'll be Mexican visas? <laughs> <laughs> Edit. <Okay. laughs> I so. think so. <laughs> Maybe anyway. this is... Yeah, go ahead. Sure, sure. No, no. You're the, you're the boss. I just was going to move along. Okay, you know. should we do the little clip? We have a little yes, clip? maybe it, it's, uh, it's <coughs> actually time to show you um, a film or really two film clips that we have. And um, the first one is from uh, Checkerboard Films. The second one from Michael Blackwood Productions. We're grateful to, to both of them um, for allowing us to show these. Uh, the first one focuses on a mural that uh, Roy did in Los Angeles. Um, and then the second one uh, brings us right into the Green Street mural. Uh, so I think um, we'll sit back, watch this for about uh, seven minutes, which is as much time as we have left. The inspiration for the mural at CAA was the Schlemmer painting uh, of uh, the Bauhaus stairway. And because this was a new IMP building in the work, I, just, I was thinking of architecture. Schlemmer was teaching at the Bauhaus and is associated with it. This building is so much about architecture, it isn't Bauhaus architecture, but it has some relationship to it, that I thought the two architectures would go together. And also, the Schlemmer has the appearance, this particular thing, of maybe people going up to the movies or something like that. I did think of the relationship between a Bauhaus and architecture and uh, Schlemmer's uh, architectural draftsman like way of working and uh, the Bauhaus idea of uh, good design for the masses. I guess what it is is this mechanical way of working that he uses and how that relates to my way of working and that made it usable. Tell me where you want them. 
<laughs> Just a few big juicy brush strokes anywhere. <laughs> any particular color? <laughs> make any Not anymore, right? <laughs> <laughs> Well, Leo wanted me to do something in that space. I think he was thinking of me having a show in the space. Um, and because it was a you know, high ceiling, very nice place to show. I had seen some very big Rosenquists in there and they looked very good. And then I, I don't know, I got the idea of doing the whole wall and Leo loved that idea. <laughs> and, uh, so that's what I did. Okay. It wasn't the first mural I did, it was the first that I really carried out. But we're gonna do it a few times. Okay. I used a kind of catalog of forms that I had used before somewhat, anyway. But I tried to have those kinds of divisions, but yet organize through them in some way so that they wouldn't only be separate items, but they would belong to the whole mural. It starts off with, a, with an Art Deco motif on the left and uh, a pyramid, which I had done before, and a funnel and, and brush strokes and composition books and a kind of uh, surrealist cubist male figure and a curvilinear female figure. I like to contrast the two as though women are very soft and men are very jagged. It's, it's just to foster that cliche, but to make uh, stylistic differences. Then um, Swiss cheese, which is purely a pattern, and uh, file things, and, and uh, the folding office chair, which is one of the boring pieces of furniture in the world, which I love to, to draw. There's a Brancusi newborn, which seems to fit right into the office furniture. Uh, there are files behind it, an adding machine tape, and electric extension cord. Then there's um, an envelope, which is part of the office furniture things, going into what looks like a lamp, but also has a Guernica aspect to it. And it goes over to the final Picasso head figure, which fit into a little niche in the architecture. I meant it to be impermanent right away, you know, and I meant it to be up there the month or whatever it was that it was up. And Jasper was having a show after me, and I didn't think he wanted to hang his work on top of my mural, so it is really destroyed. <laughs> we've, we've timed out, as they say in the business. Uh, it's 2 o'clock, and um, I just want to thank all of you for for being here, um, for bringing Roy's uh, spirit back into the building, Dorothy and Jack and Rob, three people who uh, know his work, feel his work um, probably uh, as much as anybody in the world. Thank you very much. Thank you.